my brain is like in Tahiti right now. It is not in my head. Head empty, no thoughts, does not know one, two, threes. Hi everyone, I'm Sam and welcome to my channel and my first video in my new sewing room. So I'm super excited to be here. Still playing around a little bit with lighting and angles. So some of this footage is a little weird. I know, it's fine. Anyway, so this video is going to be showing you all about how I made this skirt, which is Simplicity 8458. Specifically, I am making View A, which is this one right here that has the little overskirt and the buttons and the trimming on it. Now, this is a very, very super simple pattern. However, uh, if you'll notice, if you read this tiny little print on the front, it says vintage primer included with this pattern. So that means that the instructions that come with this pattern in the envelope are the original vintage instructions that came when they first published this pattern in 1951. So some of the instructions are a little bit lacking. So there are a couple of steps that get skipped over because the instructions kind of assume that you know what to do and where to put all of these pieces. So in case you are a beginner, um, and you have absolutely no idea what you're doing and the instructions don't help you um, because I get it This is a very beginner friendly pattern super simple only a few pieces goes together really quickly And there are a whole bunch of little ways you can kind of cheat it and make it even easier um, So it's a super beginner friendly pattern So if you are a beginner and you would like to make this and you don't quite understand what the instructions are telling you I got you. Also, if you're the kind of person that just needs to have all the instructions listed out, because I get it, I'm one of those people, I got you. So if you want to see how I made this pattern, then go ahead and keep on watching. Also, if you're curious, the blouse I also just made, and I used a true vintage pattern. This is a So Easy Advance 3077. Um, I'm prob hopefully going to be making this jacket out of the leftover material I have from the skirt very soon, so if this is something you're interested in and you want to see, go ahead and let me know. Usually I don't do true vintage patterns because they're a little bit harder to get a hold of, so it's not really useful to most people. But if you're just curious and want to see what the process le is like, go ahead and leave me a comment down below and subscribe because I might be doing this very soon. So before we get into the actual tutorial and pattern review, there are a couple things I do want to talk about and address with this pattern. Uh, so if you're not really interested and you just want to skip to me going, starting, cutting things out and working with it, I'm going to put a timestamp right here or somewhere on the screen. So if you want to just skip ahead, you can go ahead and do that. So a couple things to look out for with this pattern. The first thing I want to talk about is the zipper because that's something you're going to have to go buy. Now, when I was scanning through the instructions before I bought the zipper, I didn't really read the instructions too carefully and I thought that this was going to be a lapped zipper, very similar to the swan skirt I made. I'm pretty sure I made a video about it. Um, anyway, I thought it was going to instruct me to do a lapped zipper, which is why I bought just a regular seven inch polyester zipper. Once I actually got to the instructions and I was reading them, it basically had me do this kind of pseudo invisible zipper kind of thing going on. You'll see when we get there, but go ahead and if you feel confident in doing it, just get an invisible zipper because I feel like it would look a lot better than having a little um, thing right there. Anyway, just go ahead and get yourself an invisible zipper. It's going to look just as good, honestly, probably better than the method that they have you do. Uh, also, if you're going to be using invisible zippers, I highly recommend go to Amazon, search invisible zipper foot. Don't get the plastic one that comes and you really have to look for it at the fabric stores. There's a metal one that is just so much easier to use and it's so much better. So highly recommend that one. I'll try to find one and put a link in the description below. The next thing I want to talk about is interfacing. So I looked it up and fusible interfacing wasn't developed until the 1960s. So when the pattern refers to interfacing, it really just refers to sew-in interfacing. Now, if you want to go to the store and buy some lightweight sew-in interfacing, go right ahead and do that. It's what it's there for. But if that's one thing that you really just don't want to either spend money on or if you have a whole lot of fabrics in your stash, if you have another very lightweight fabric that is non-stretch, has already been pre-treated, so basically like 100% thin cotton, and if you want to use that as an interfacing, go right ahead. It's I'm sure people have done that in the past, and I'm sure it's a very valid thing. Now, I used fusible interfacing. I used two types of fusible interfacing. You will see it later. Now, the instructions don't really go into detail about when to apply the interfacing. They only really talk about it once. 
Um, but just pay attention to the actual instructions on the pattern pieces themselves because that's going to tell you how many of each piece to cut and from what to cut it out. So for example, the waistband. The waistband says cut one of fabric and then cut one of interfacing. Now the instructions don't ever tell you to install the interfacing on the waistband, so you just kind of have to do it at some point before you sew it on. So I did want to note that also in this fine print, they say for contemporary sewing instructions, visit simplicity.com, type in the pattern number, and then under add to cart, there should be a download link that says find PDF or download PDF. So I didn't search for these instructions until after I already completed the pattern. I wanted to do this review and do this tutorial based solely on what came in the envelope. And since these instructions didn't come in the envelope, I didn't do it. But after I finished and before I filmed this intro, I went to the Simplicity website to try to find the instructions, uh, just so I could kind of review them and see if they addressed all the same things that I wished. And I genuinely could not find them. And I am a millennial. I know my way around a website. So I don't know if there was just a checkbox that somebody didn't check at some point, but I could not find the contemporary instructions, which is all the more reason I want to put this video out there to help you. Another thing I want to briefly talk about before we get started is the buttons and the buttonholes. So this pattern has you do actual functional buttonholes. I really don't see why. I'm trying to think of scenarios in which you would need to unbutton this flap and then button it back down. I really can't think of one, maybe ironing, but you know, if this flap is gonna be on top, why do you really care about what the underneath looks like? Or maybe it's for like, you know, in those old movies where you uh, hike up your skirt to hold eggs or something, I don't know. Point is, having the functional buttonholes is nice and they give you a couple of different options to do it. I'll talk about it later. But at the end of the day, if you're pretty new to sewing or if your machine doesn't have a buttonhole stitch and you're really intimidated, or if your fabric just frays really easily and you don't really want to cut buttonholes into it, just sew the buttons on top. Just mark where they're supposed to be, sew them, and you're going to be good to go. Another thing I want to talk about is measuring correctly. So if you're new to sewing, you will notice or hopefully you should notice that there are different sizes at the top of your pattern and then you're going to cut to different sizes. Now the thing I want to point out is your pattern size and your standard clothing size when you go to the store are completely different. As an example, right now my standard clothing size is somewhere between a 12 and a 14, but my pattern size is closer to a 20. So especially with this pattern in particular, the waistband is meant to finish at your exact waist measurement and the exact waist measurement listed on the pattern. So there's not really a whole lot of room to let it out or to take it in if you need to. So just do yourself a favor and measure yourself ideally before you even buy the pattern, but especially before you start. And you'll see me do a little bit of measuring later in my method of how I mark my patterns. So the first thing I'm going to do is open up the pattern and search for the waistband. I'm going to use the waistband to determine what size I'm going to cut the rest of the pattern out on. So I'm going to fold it in half and hold it up to myself in the mirror and then see where the pattern lines match up. So for me, I'm going to be cutting this out on a size 18 because that is the pattern line that matches up. And to, for a reference, I am about 33 and a half of a waist measurement right now. So now I'm going to lay out and properly measure my fabric. I have five yards of this, but it's in two cuts. So I need to make sure that at least one of the cuts is big enough for me to cut this out on. So now I'm going through the rest of the tissue and cutting out the rest of the pieces I need for this pattern, which includes the front, the back, the facing, and the front apron. So now I'm going to lay out my fabric and just kind of do a little test to see where I can make things lie and to see if they will fit on the fabric. And I'm slowing this down because you will soon see the exact moment where I realized the pinstripes on my fabric are going the wrong direction. So my brain kind of um, exploded for a little bit because this is very much throwing a wrench in my plans and I'm very sad about it. Um, but I sat there and I thought for a little bit and then I had this crazy idea of why don't I take the fabric and just fold it the other way. Now I know you're not really supposed to do this because of warp and weft and making sure the fabric grain line is proper but you know what? I'm a loose cannon sewist who lives on the edge and plays by some rules. 
So now I am laying all of my pieces out and trying to see if they would fit. And I learned that the waistband would not fit as one piece. So I would have to fold it in half and cut it as two, adding an additional seam allowance so that I would it would stay the same size. And now starts the very long process of matching up all of the pin stripes, pin by pin, stripe by stripe. And for your sake, I cut the overwhelming majority of that out. I did it on two sides and just kind of relied on the fabric kind of falling nicely once I had those two sides lined, sides lined up. And it worked out pretty well for the most part. It only got off like a tiny little bit and that's perfectly within the realm of I am okay with it. So here I have all my pattern pieces laid out and I'm going to cut them out. Now I'm moving on to cutting out the interfacing and I am using two different kinds of interfacing. So for the waistband, I am using a mid-weight interfacing because I want that to be a little bit more stiff and a little bit more sturdy. And I am cutting out one of that. And then for the facing, I'm using a featherweight interfacing, which is a lot thinner and it's gonna help the fabric move a little bit more. So I'm cutting out two of those because that's what it says on the pattern piece. So if you have larger pieces left over from your cutting, go ahead and set those aside. Don't get rid of them yet. We might need them in a future step. So the first thing I'm going to do is pick out my thread and I picked this out in the store when I forgot a swatch. So I am pretty proud of how well it matches. I'm also going to go ahead and wind two bobbins because I hate winding bobbins in the middle of a project. And since this is a brand new spool of thread, I am taking the stickers off and I'm about to go ahead and wind my bobbins. Now I am doing a couple of test sews to make sure that I like the tension and where my settings are. And I realized that I wanted a little bit less tension, so I went ahead and adjusted that real quick. Or maybe it was more. I filmed this a while ago. I don't entirely remember. Anyway, do a little test swatch. It makes sure that you have the settings that you want. So the first thing I'm going to do is sew together my waistband. So I am matching up the pinstripes as close as I can. This is not in the instructions because the instructions assume you cut it out of one piece. So if you had to do this, go ahead and do this now. So now I'm pinning through the pinstripes, making sure that the needle or the pin comes out and enters the exact same spot on both sides. And it matches up pretty well, if I do say so myself. And we are moving on to step number one, which is based center front and center back seams, as well as the side seams. So we're going to match things up. And since this fabric doesn't really have a front and a back, I'm just using the seams that are already lined up because I cut them there. It's cheating a little bit, but you know what? It works. So again, I am trying to be careful about lining up the pinstripes. I don't know if it's just the nature of this fabric or if I messed up a little bit, but it seems that they match up really well at the top and at the bottom, but not in the center. And just to keep my sanity, I put pins in the shape of two little Fs on the front of the front section so that I would know what the right side is and which section is the front because they all kind of look very similar. So I would recommend doing that. Um, it just makes your life a whole lot easier, helps you keep things straight. And if you see my hair looking a little weird, we are in the middle of quarantine still, or we should be. Um, so yeah, quarantine hit. So now I am matching up the front and the back sections and I'm going to pin from the top down and I'm also going to stitch from the top down. Now for basting, you want a very long stitch length. Now, generally you want to stitch from the center outward or from a fixed point outward. So I'm starting all of my stitching from the waistband and moving down to the hem. That way, in case something stretches or gets a little bit wonky, I can hide it within the hem. And for this round, you are going to sew all of the seams exactly the same and not worry about any sort of openings. Then the instructions stay to let this hang overnight. So grab a pants hanger and just clip it and find a nice out of the way spot where it can hang freely overnight. I am using this neat little hook on the back of my door and just leave it alone and let it sit. 
Now there are other things we can do in the meantime, like move on to the overskirt. So we're going to attach the interfacing to the wrong side of the overskirt. Now I'm using fusible interfacing, so I'm going to iron that. But first I'm doing a quick little test swatch because again, I don't know what kind of fabric this is. And I just wanna make sure that the fabric itself can withstand the heat and it looks like it can. So I'm good to go using a pressing cloth, applying the interfacing. The next step is to move on to the bound buttonholes, but there is a little stipulation that says if you have a machine foot for it, you can go ahead and do machine buttonholes. So I did a little test to see how they worked, and the bound buttonholes looked okay, but honestly it just seemed like too much work for what they are, and uh, since the machine buttonhole is totally acceptable within the realm of the instructions, I decided to do machine buttonholes instead. Now, if you're doing machine buttonholes, don't do them at this step. Wait until after you have the facing on, which is the second facing, not this interfacing. If you're doing bound buttonholes, go ahead and do those now. And the reason for that is you're going to have to slit a hole in the facing so that you can open everything up and it will be cleaner to finish bound buttonholes by doing that hole in the facing. But if you're doing machine buttonholes, you might as well wait until you do the facing and then just machine stitch through all of the layers of fabric at once. It just saves you a little bit of a step. So here I am putting in my machine buttonholes. I marked where they should start and where ideally they should end. So now I'm going through and opening them. So I'm taking a seam ripper to poke a hole and then using some very, very sharp, tiny scissors and I am cutting through it. Normally I just kind of take my seam ripper through it, but with interfacing, it, sometimes it's hard to get it to tear. So I am using these really tiny little scissors. And I'm making sure that the buttons pass through and I am fray checking so much. Fray check is your friend. Fray check, please sponsor me. So the next step is to realize that the rest of the instructions refer back to bound buttonholes, which we did not do. And if you want to do, you should look up someone else's tutorial. So now we are moving on to the facing. So with wrong sides together, we are basting the overskirt facing to the overskirt. Now, if you recall correctly, we have this extra piece of interfacing that matches the facing perfectly. Now, I didn't have enough room to cut out facing from my main fabric, so since it really shouldn't be seen, I went ahead and just used a random fabric I had in my stash. So I'm going to take a guess and assume that we need to put the inner facing on that piece of facing because it tells us to cut two, so we're supposed to have two, but the instructions only tell us to put one in. So I'm just guessing that it goes here. Honestly, I think putting it on the front of the skirt on the underside kind of would work better because it would give your buttons a little bit more stability in there, but I'm just kind of going with it. And I'm also taking this opportunity to attach the facing to the waistband since the instructions don't explicitly tell you when to do that. So while I have the iron out, let's just go ahead and get that done. All right, so now that we have that taken care of, now we can go ahead and base the overskirt facing to the overskirt. So I'm only showing you to sew down the sides, but you also should be sewing down the top. So I'm matching that up. It doesn't match up 100% perfectly. That's mostly because I didn't iron the facing fabric before I cut it out. I know, bad Sam. But I'm matching it up as well as I can, and I am going to baste that. So again, when you're basting, double check, put all your feet back where they're supposed to be, put all your stitching settings the way they're supposed to be and just baste them. I am basting on about a 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance just to make sure that it will be fully within the seam allowance when I sew everything up for real and that you won't see the basting stitches. So now the next step is to decide on the trim. Now I had a little bit of trouble deciding. I bought both black and brown trim for the skirt. So I put up a quick little poll on my Instagram. Follow me at Thread and Needlefish and let my followers help me choose. So I let that sit for a while. It is now the next day. So I'm going to take that skirt down and lay it out nice and flat and I'm just gonna check to see if anything crazy happened with the bias settling see if any of the seams got really wobbly um, from the fabric settling kind of different from each other and it did a little bit but it's nothing too major so I decided to just go ahead with what we're doing so now we are going back to step one and we are going to stitch the seams leaving leaving the left side open below the notches for the zipper. So if you were looking at it inside out with the front on top of you, that's still the left side. 
So now with everything stitched together, I am going to do a very quick little try on to make sure everything fits. I don't think I stitched it together yet. I think it was still basted, but this is just to help me figure out if I needed to sew with some bigger seam allowances, sew with some smaller seam allowances. But anyway, now it's time to move on to the poll results and it was 50-50. Five people voted for brown trim, five people voted for black trim. This does not help me. I am way too indecisive for this. So I just made the executive decision to do brown. I figured it would be less obtrusive. So I am using seam binding and I know there is a proper way to sew on seam binding, but I am not very good at it. It involves a technique called stitch in the ditch, which I am very bad at. So I decided I would much rather have one line of even nice professional looking stitching all the way around rather than some parts that have hidden stitching because it's in the seam and then some little wiggly stitch in the ditch kind of stuff. Yeah, I decided just one line of stitching, make it look good. That's good for me. And this is how I am finishing the corners of the seam binding. I'm just kind of folding it in a little bit, finger pressing it. Then I'm going to tuck all of the edges in nicely and then fold it under. Now this creates a very thick um, piece of material for your machine to sew through. So just be patient when you get to it and sewing. I'm also making sure that the tail is long enough that I'm going to catch it once I pivot and turn down the machine. So here I am, and hopefully you will see just exactly how tiny the seam allowance is. I was aiming for about a sixteenth of an inch. And just slow and steady, go very slow. Make sure you're not stuck on yourself on the machine. And like I mentioned, some of this is very difficult for your machine to get through. So I had to go get my work gloves and physically turn my machine through it and help it. Go ahead. If you got to help your machine, help your machine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't push your machine too hard. Um, but yeah, once you got to get it through those difficult parts, then the rest is smooth sailing. So now I'm going to look at this, make sure everything is attached properly. If you look carefully at seam binding, there's a shorter side and a longer side. So if you put the shorter side on top, then if you make it through that, then you are definitely getting the longer side. So now I'm just showing you exactly how tiny the seam allowance. I'm actually really proud of it, which is why I'm showing it off so much, TBH. All right, next time to move on to finishing the underside of the bound buttonholes. And again, if you are doing bound buttonholes, now is the time to do that. But if you're doing machine buttonholes, just wait and do them at this stage. So now I am very carefully, looks like I'm not being careful, but I am. I am coming from the top through the buttonhole on the top and just cutting a little opening all the way to the facing. And then I'm doing sort of like a pseudo hand stitched buttonhole. I'm really just whip stitching this down to keep it all together into one piece of fabric at the opening. So I am coming up, so I'm passing my needle through the buttonhole, opening the buttonhole and passing it through, and then I am passing it through the fabric where the stitching is. So I'm creating a bit of a whip stitch and it's not gonna have a lot of structural integrity, it's really just to keep the buttonhole together. So once that is done, and I'm hopefully you can see what I'm doing, I also fray checked that. I don't think I talked about that. So now we're going to do the overskirt. So we're putting the wrong side of the overskirt to the right side of the fabric. So you are attaching it exactly how it would lay as if you were wearing it. So wrong side down. I'm sorry for my lighting. I know it is awful. And I'm stitching with a one half inch seam allowance all along the top. So I'm matching up the centers and then working outward and then we're going to stitch and then that's going to be a line. So we're skipping the snap fastening because we are doing a zipper. Um, so again, I thought this was going to be a lapped zipper. It wound up not. And this is the shot that was lit so poorly. I rearranged my entire room to finally get this done. So now I am basting the little seam allowance left over from that opening flap open. I went ahead and ironed it earlier but now I'm basting it so it will stay nice and flat and make sure you are using big basting stitches because you will have to remove these later and keeping them a different size from the regular zipper helps you make sure that you're only taking out the basting stitches and not the ones from the zipper. So it just saves you a little bit of confusion, makes it a little bit easier on you later. All 
All right, so now that that's done, we're gonna go ahead and install the zipper. So with it closed, I am pinning up from the bottom towards the top, just, you know, making sure the top of the zipper is kind of even with the top, but we are adding a waistband on top of it. So if it's not perfect, don't worry about it. So with the zipper closed, I am matching up either side to make sure that it lays nicely and flat when the zipper is closed. If you did it open, things might not line up properly and you might get a little weird bubble, but All right, so now we are going to be sewing the zipper. Ideally, it would sew down and then across and then back up, but that didn't quite work out that way. So I'm using a zipper foot or a cording foot, as they call in the instructions. And when you're using one of these, you want to make sure that the plastic bit of the zipper, the teeth, is going to fall nicely under that little divot in the foot. And it's kind of hard to see, but you will feel it. So you should only feel the tape the zipper tape and your fabric underneath the actual needle and you will feel that little ridge helping to guide you so this will give you a nice even stitch all along the zipper so i'm going from the top to the bottom of the zipper and once you get kind of close to the end with a little pull you might have to wiggle around a little bit pull it up a little bit make sure it gets out of the way and just kind of just go with it I'm not particularly good at zippers, so don't really take my advice. You should look up another tutorial about how to sew zippers because I'm sure other people are much, much, much more adept at this. But if you are using a zipper foot, you do want to pay attention to what side of the foot the needle is on because that's going to tell you which side of the zipper that you are going to be sewing. So I'm double checking, making sure that I did in fact catch all of the zipper tape. Sometimes I don't because I speed through things and I don't pin them properly, but I did a good job this time. So I'm proud of myself. So I'm zipping it up, making sure that I didn't catch the teeth in anything. And now I'm going to reset my foot to the other side and do the exact same thing all over again. So here the zipper is nice and finished making sure that it's not catching on the fabric as I unzip and rezip it, and it looks pretty good. So now what I'm doing is taking out the basting stitches, and it's much easier to see what the basting stitches are because they are about three times longer than the regular stitches. So now I'm doing another quick little try on, making sure that everything fits properly before I do the waistband. There are a lot of pins in here, so I'm being careful. And I'm excited because uh, this is the first time like with all the stuff on, I don't know. My life's kind of boring right now. And it looks like it will fit pretty carefully, pretty perfectly. So I'm pretty happy with it. All right, I'm really low on camera battery, so I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do instead of showing you. So the instructions for this waistband has you do something really weird. So it has you pin this to the back sort of okay so it has you pin it like this and then you flip it in and then flip it over and then flip it over again and finish it on the outside that's dumb and way too complicated so instead what i've done is i have bound one end of the waistband and the other one we're going to do this and we're going to attach it right sides together on the outside and i'm going to go follow markings and match up markings later but we're going to sew 5 8 inch seam allowance here. I have already pre-creased this piece. So we sew and we're going to flip and we're going to fold. And this way we will have a nice clean edge on that side or a nice clean waistband on this side. And then we will have a nice bound edge on the inside that you can just whip stitch down. It's so much easier to do it this way. I don't know why they're having you do all this crazy stuff, but just do it like that. Okay. All right, so here I have the waistband attached. Um, instead of doing this by hand, I was lazy and did this by machine, but I did it from the front side. So I have, for the most part, a nice even line of stitching uh, because on the diagram and in the instructions, it looks like there's stitching along the bottom and the top. So I just real quick went ahead and added, you can't really see because dark on dark, but there's some stitching on the bottom and on the top. So now what I'm going to do is bind the edges of this uh, and then sew on some hooks and eyes and the underneath buttons and then I'm done. Okay, so here's where I'm at with the skirt. I got the waistband on. It is very tight, so definitely make sure you are measuring because there's not a whole lot of room for movement in here. Um, the skirt didn't quite fit into the waistband, so I had to do a little extra kind of pleat here to make it fit. Um, I don't think it's really that 
weird. Um, but I did want to mention because there is one more thing that I kind of want to touch on a little bit. So when you have a round hem and kind of like a circle skirt, and this is a partial circle skirt, to do the hem, you want to do some gathering stitches along the bottom of it and then kind of gather that up and then fold up the hem to make it nice and um, to make it lay flat because that's how physics kind of works with the shapes. I'm not going to do that mostly because to be completely honest, I don't want to have to wind another bobbin and I don't trust that I can do all of this three times with the bobbin that I have left. So I'm just going to fold it up, uh, give myself a half inch seam and then a one inch seam and then sew along the half inch because um, I'm also really lazy and don't want to do this by hand. And since there is top stitching on the waistband, I'm going to use that as justification to do top stitching on the bottom. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be lazy. Um, and then I'm going to tack on the buttons and then I'll be 100%, well, I'll talk about it later, but then I'll be functionally done. So to show you how I mark the buttons, I am taking a pen and I'm going through the center of the buttonhole. So for this, I'm not using the markings on the pattern piece. I'm marking where the buttons are. So I'm not marking where the buttons should be. I'm marking where the buttons actually are. So you can't really see it, but they are there. And so I sewed on the buttons by hand and here we have the finished skirt in all its glory. So I'm super happy with it. So this is it with just the skirt, no petticoat, and this is it with a petticoat. I don't know if I let go so you can actually like see the drape. There it is. Yeah, so here it is with a petticoat. And my little, my little cow got in the way. That's okay, he's cute. I thought I cut this out. Oh well. My, like I said, my brain is not in my head right now. But here it is. Here's the finished skirt. I am very happy with it. And you really can't see the odd facing that much unless I like actually twirled around in it. And let's be honest, how much are you actually twirling out in public in real life? Just real quick, I did want to pop on because I kind of mentioned earlier that my closure was really awful and messy. So this is the hook and eye that I used. I just kind of held it where it was supposed to be. Uh, this red kind of sticks out a little bit, but I'm probably at some point just going to take a brown sharpie and color it over. Or maybe a green sharpie because that's how color theory works. Anyway, um, I have definitely done that before on other projects and it's fine, really. Uh, but I tried to bind the edges, but since this is so thick, I didn't want to have to fold things over a thousand times because I didn't want to put my machine through that again. And I thought I was going to do like a nice zigzag stitch across the top and across the bottom to finish it off nicely. Um, it ended up kind of destroying it, but you know what? That's okay. Um, so I'm kind of thinking I might do some sort of strap on top made of this material. Um, and just kind of attach it here and then put maybe a snap here so that I can just go on top. But also from far away, um, and I usually, I will probably be wearing a like blousier shirt like this with this. It, it It's really not that noticeable, so I'm not completely brokenhearted over it. So that was my tutorial and my pattern review. Long story short, I really like this pattern. I think it's super cute. The pattern itself is very simple. It's very beginner friendly. And like I said, there are bits and pieces of it where you can kind of cheat and make it even easier on yourself. So I made view A, but view B looks like it's going to be even simpler, even easier to get through. So in short, it's a good pattern. The instructions leave a little bit to be desired. So part of the reason that these sewing instructions are the way they are is because in the 1950s, it was much more common for people to know how to make their own clothes or to have their clothes made. So when pattern companies are putting together patterns and instructions, the assumed basic kind of knowledge and skill level of the general public was a lot higher than it is now. So they were able to kind of skip some steps and save paper and save resources and be able to omit a couple of steps every now and then. Anyway, I'm really happy with this skirt. I like how it turned out. This is exactly what I wanted. I wanted just a nice brown skirt to go with all my brown based gray shoes. Um, it's also very fall appropriate, which I am very happy with. This is the furthest north I have ever lived. So even though central Georgia is not north at all, I might get a little bit of a fall this year for the first time in like my entire life. So we shall see. Anyway, if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe. I have a couple of other sewing projects and sewing videos in the works. I really like doing these pattern reviews. I like being able to get into them and kind of work through all the kinks and find all the places that might be a little bit confusing or hard to do so that I can tell you so that if I make a mistake, 
hopefully you won't. And again, if you want more behind the scenes stuff, including helping me make huge decisions, like what trim I should put on this, then go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram over at thread and needlefish. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. You see, nearly every day I give the cat a piece of turkey for my turkey sandwich, but we are out of turkey and she keeps following me around telling me, mom, it's turkey time, but we're out of turkey. We don't have any in the house. So I'm, I'm going to have to deal with this very whiny little baby for the rest of the afternoon. I uh, know. I'm sorry. You want to tell people hi? You want to say hi? She said, no, I want to say hi. I want turkey, mom. Want to follow me to the kitchen? It's where we have the turkey.